Okay, I think we're just about ready to get started this morning. Thanks so much for joining us and welcome to everyone to this open forum discussion on the latest updates to digital apprenticeships. We're really excited to be joined by some fantastic HR and tech professionals in the room this morning. Um, some great names on the list, MOJ, CGI, Simply Business, Deloitte, News UK, just to name but a few. And of course, our very own in-house experts, Ed and Diana as well. It's going to be a super interactive session this morning and we'd love to hear from as many of you as possible over the course of the session. It's absolutely a space to get involved, ask questions and share your insights to help us shape the future of Makers Apprenticeships. So don't be shy. Please feel free to turn your cameras on now so we can see your lovely faces, but please do keep yourselves on mute until we come to the Q&A session in half an hour's time. So before we jump in, just a quick reminder of what we'll be covering this morning. First, I'll be handing over to the amazing Diana Constantino for uh, a rundown of the key updates from the government and what they mean for you as an employer. Then we'll open the floor and our head of course development, Ed Weathers, will chair the discussion and ask for your input on a whole host of topics related to the future of apprenticeships and more. But first, Diana, I hear that uh, digital apprenticeships are more flexible and easier to implement than ever before. Can you talk us through that? Yeah, thanks, um, Alex, and welcome to everybody this morning. Um, here at Bakers, we're really excited about the digital review um, and we're here today to just go through the executive summary of it and hopefully draw you to some key points as to why we feel that this is really positive news. Um, there's a wide range of people on the call today, so um, I'm just going to zoom out and just remind everybody at Makers what we do. We work really hard to launch tech careers and we do that in a, a variety of ways, but today we're here to talk about um, apprenticeships. Um, as we go through the presentation, I'll just turn my video off so that um, you're able to clearly see the slides and obviously hear the audio. Through our products, diversity is at the core of what we do. Um, and currently, as the slide details, 33% of our makers are women. And that stat's even higher in apprenticeships. It's 40.5. Um, and that's way higher, almost double, than the industry average at 17%. Diversity is at the core of what we do, and we care deeply about it. Um, and as I go on to explain, it's also a key feature of the digital review. At Makers, we've had um, an exciting and positive journey on our apprenticeship delivery. We currently, um, our success story is 100% pass rate, with 46 of those passes being merits or distinctions, and 38% achieving the highest grade of distinction. We've had a busy year despite the pandemic with 147 apprentices heading for Gateway this year and the year's still not out. We have two more co full cohorts joining us before the end of the year. So today we're hoping to provide some information, some brief information about the pandemic support and the Institute and awarding bodies response to the pandemic. Um, and just making sure that everybody on the call is clear on some of the support that's been made available to ensure that apprenticeships continue to be successful. And here at Makers, we've found the way that we've been reached out to in terms of support really, really helpful. We've had remote exam sit-ins, so the components that form part of the apprenticeship have been available to sit online. And there's been additional support and flexibility of rules around amending timelines, allowing apprentices to have more time or perhaps break due to medical reasons or business reasons. There's been lots of support for training providers to still allow apprentices to progress to gateway, despite conditions such as being furloughed or being made redundant. And we've really welcomed um, the the initiatives from the government on financial incentives for businesses hiring um, apprentices at this time. Um, we, we at Makers have also been really reactive to the pandemic and we're really proud to have developed a rapid response apprenticeship to which you can fast track talent in um, as little time as six weeks. Um, but today is not about our current um, product offering, but more about the changes that will affect what Makers does in this quarter and in the year ahead. And we're hoping that this information is useful to you. 
So let's start at the high level. What is this digital review? Why is it important as hiring partners and stakeholders in apprenticeships that you're aware of? And why particularly at Makers, we're celebrating the work of this positive review and what it means. So this presentation will aim to provide not just future hiring partners, but our current hiring partners with that executive summary. And this is only the first, um, if you like, delivery of comms. We aim to get lots of support materials out in this quarter and next year in order to support all stakeholders. We'll, we'll cover some of the high level changes as well as dive into our level four software developer course today. Um, but it's really important um, that we remember the kind of context of the Institute. In terms of educational organisation, the Institute is fairly young. Its priorities when it first set up were really just to generate as many high quality apprenticeship standards as possible. And it's done a really good job, to be fair. There are currently 400 apprenticeship standards live or coming out approved for delivery. And this has largely been through the work of trailblazer groups that have been set up representing employers, training providers um, and um, EPAOs. Those are the exam boards that approve the apprenticeships. And now as the Institute matures, its focus is now shifting towards ensuring quality, consistency across all of the standards that are in the suite and looking to review the legacy apprenticeships that they refer to that were published right at the beginning. And put short, they published a lot of apprenticeships in the digital suite together. And because they were all published at the same time, a lot of them have all come up um, for renewal at the same time. Hence this big digital review. So what did the review aim to achieve? And it's really important to stress that the review is still in process. It hasn't finished its work. And we'll be looking at the elements of the review. But the review generally looked to take a route wide look at all the standards as a family, all of them together. What commonality they have? Is there any overlap? And more importantly, are there any gaps in the employment sector that the standards need to meet in order to meet the demand? And most importantly, quality assure. It's been overly positive, the quality of education of the new apprenticeship standards. And they're really keen at the Institute to continue this on and really making sure that the content of these apprenticeship standards aren't outdated and do reflect the current practice. And they're absolutely committed and passionate about this being employer led. And in this review, you can see clear evidence of where they've encompassed not just um, a training provider consultation, but actually all of the stakeholders with the employer being the most important. So why did the digital route come up first? Quite simply, it was chosen because of its characteristics. Um, the digital route was chosen um, as it's such a fast changing sector, as we all know. It has its unique challenges, but it was also one of the earliest to adopt the new apprenticeship standards in the sector. And it's one of the sectors that really does use the apprenticeship um, levy um, to access tech talent. And therefore, a total of 12 apprenticeships were identified to be reviewed and approved for delivery. And all of these apprenticeships were live prior to April 2017, when the Institute first set about its work on this. It also forms quite a big part in the industrial strategy by the government, whereby building Britain fit for the future has a lot of pull on digital capability and skills. And so it was really important that if the apprenticeship levy was going to be used um, to fill those gaps, that the apprenticeship standards needed to be fit for purpose and fit for the sector. So I spoke a little bit about what the process was. Um, if we dive into some more detail, they started off with some really high level digital route considerations, which we'll be having a look into. They then opened up what must be now nearly two years ago, a consultation process where they went out to stakeholders and then each trailblazer group that had the job to review the standard was be given um, very specific standard feedback from all parties that had been involved in delivering the apprenticeship over the last three years. And then the trailblazer group was given the job 
over those two years to revise the standards. And that's essentially where we're at today. The Trailblazer has finished their work under those 12 standards. And we're now entering the final stages of the process, which requires the publication of the endpoint assessment, the finance confirmation of how much um, from the levy these apprenticeships are going to cost to run, and then essentially the ministerial sign off and the final publication. And the reason why we're talking to you today is that is set to all happen and is on track for this quarter, which means these standards will be going live in January 2021. So I mentioned that we would take a quick look into the general considerations. So what the Institute wanted to achieve um, was that across the suite of these 12 apprenticeships, that it really took note of the advances that have been made in the last three to four years in technology. Although the apprenticeship standard off, started off with exam components and mandatory qualifications, they really wanted to use this as an opportunity to review whether that was necessary still in these standards. When the standards were written, they were very much written for big businesses. And there's a really key driver now that the levy is accessible for SMEs, that we make sure that standards are accessible to all businesses, not just the larger ones. And so the revision really needed to take um, into consideration this. And also across these two to three years, there's been some really good best practice. And so what the Trailblazer groups are aiming to do is take consideration of that best practice and make it part of the specifications that underpin the standards. And they wanted to, at every opportunity, make sure that the apprenticeship standards promoted diversity and established principles for future approval. The biggest change that we were tasked with in our trailblazer groups was to move away from the standards and develop occupational briefs. Now, I won't spend too much time going into this, but this is a wider consideration. Vocational education has changed into technical education. With the introduction of T-levels, there's now a demand for us to have occupational briefs for each of the qualifications. And those briefs should be able to be put together to identify a really lovely journey, an occupational map, through where a learner can start as early as level two with a T level, right up to degree level, a level six technical apprenticeship. And so all of these reviews had to consider this and make sure that there was no overlap or gap. As I said, the consultation process was a really positive experience for the Institute and started in September 2018. There are uh, just around 200 responses and we can be assured that those responses came from a wide range of stakeholders. This included employers, and encouragingly, half of the responses came from employers, with apprentices and training providers also represented. And generally, the reflection of how things have gone over the three years was largely positive. 85% of apprentices said the apprenticeship had met their expectations, 95% really thought that it reflected the content of the job that they were doing and also the compliance and the delivery of off-the-job training was largely positive and also 20 to 39 percent which is what the apprenticeship was aiming to achieve but there was definitely a flavor in this consultation that there was room for improvement so we spent a little bit of time talking about the first part of the process. So it'd be good now to dive into um, the apprenticeship standards. So I appreciate um, we have a, a wide range of people on the call and some of us um, are, are delivering the software developer level four, which is what we deliver here at Makers. But also there are some wider considerations in the digital review um, for a list of standards um, that are here. So what has been the outcome of this review for the digital suite. And I suppose the easiest way of presenting this in the time that we have today is that there are three major outcomes that have come out of this review. The first being a positive outcome, which means that the standard has been retained uh, with revisions. The second being there are some minor changes, um, and it's important to note that some of those um, are quite um, significant, although categorised by the Institute as minor, because the standard remains. 
And then there are another um, outcome, which is withdrawn, which sounds quite harsh at first. I, I think it's better described as they've been withdrawn and included in different um, standards. And that's mainly because there was that overlap of content that I spoke about before. But in summary, the Institute has decided that the cyber security technologist at level four really needed to be um, broadened to incorporate pathways. The revised standard now has three pathways which incorporate the cyber intrusion analyst and a consultancy role in cyber security. The infrastructure technician at level three um, was broadened and now contains the withdrawn standard, the unified communications technician, and that will now be one apprenticeship standard rather than two. Similarly, the network engineer at level four has been broadened and in it now contains the content from the unified communications troubleshooter at level four. So again, here another example of two standards being made into one. The digital and technology solutions professional at level six is retained, but on the strong basis that each of the individual options are reviewed. Again, like the cybersecurity, there will be pathways enabling hiring partners to really carve out the right um, journey for the context that the apprentice is joining. Some exciting changes to the IS business analyst at level four. It's been heavily revised and broadened in scope. It now covers digital product um, analysis and digital business analysis. And the occupation now applies to a much broader range of sectors rather than just the traditional information systems that the old standard used to meet. The software tester um, has been considered. Initially, the review asked the Trailblazer Group to consider taking it down to level three. Um, but positively, through the review process, it has been maintained at level four and has a lot more content to it. It's a really exciting apprenticeship standard. The data analyst at level four, our own software developer at level four, and the software development technician level three um, has been heavily revised, but remains the same and, and very relevant to employers. And these changes will result in officially the following apprenticeship standards being completely withdrawn. They're listed there, but it's the cyber intrusion analyst, the unified communications technician, and the unified communications troubleshooter. So have, let's have a look at the level four software developer that I know a number of us on the call today are keen to see. So what changes have been made um, and that are now sitting with ministerial sign off? So for those of you that are unfamiliar with the current apprenticeship journey here at Makers, we're really proud of our delivery model with an immersive boot camp that starts at the beginning of the apprenticeship with 12 weeks of high quality training. And then from day one, our software developers add value to the workplace and commence a placement that um, gets them to cover the knowledge module, functional skills if required, a vendor qualification, and a wonderful portfolio that they put together to evidence their progress. At the end of that, the employer writes a reference and then Gateway commences. In its current format, Gateway consists of a synoptic project that's hosted at Makers and is five days in length. And then there's an interview where a BCS, the exam board assessor, looks at the portfolio, looks at the project and awards a grade. So what does the change look like? So um, we could probably do a two hour webinar just on the changes, but in the time that we have, as I said, this is just the start of some of the updates that are heading our way for software development. So as I said, the occupational maps and the need for occupational briefs has meant that the standards that are currently in place have been removed and they've been replaced with occupational briefs. And for each occupational brief, there has been detailed the knowledge, the skills and the behaviours that need to be evidenced in order for that brief to be met. And what we can take from this is real positive news. These occupational briefs are current, realistic and they match so many of the software development job descriptions that we see in the sector currently. And really positively, the input of SMEs has meant that they're able to access these occupational briefs and they're really excited about starting these in 2021. 
There was some overlap in the old standard with the software technician. And um, really good news is that this has been removed and now strongly sits in the software technician without any overlap. And positively, the apprenticeship stays um, technology agnostic, which is really important for this apprenticeship. Some of the things that hiring partners will be celebrating along um, with us at Makers is that the placement has really been um, unlocked and now provides a platform where those software developers can really add value and get on with the job that is being a software developer thriving in the environment that they join. The knowledge module has been removed, the vendor qualification has been removed. The English and maths content has been updated to reflect the new English and maths qualification and the long employer reference has been removed. So with all those removals, what's been added, you might ask? And I suppose for me, the significant change is the endpoint assessment. So uh, traditionally, this would take two weeks. Um, but scheduled over three months and this has now moved to a four to six month uh, window with the employer really being in the driving seat of this assessment. It's really welcomed as the project will be a real world work project and what we will be able to do is to schedule it um, at the right timing not just for the apprentice but also for the employer so that that triangulation can um, result in the best possible outcome um, for the apprentice. Um, the timing of when this work will be done sometimes is really key in different hiring partner environments. And there's real flexibility here um, for us to schedule this with this in mind. The apprentice will carry out the project and then complete a report covering compulsory components. And as a training provider, we will make sure that leading up to the endpoint assessment, we work really hard to do a mock version of this. So they're really ready to go when the window opens. So this is just draft at the moment, because obviously we are waiting for the endpoint assessment guidance to be published. But we now see a timeline that enables us to continue to thrive in the manner that we deliver these apprenticeships. We're still able to offer our off the job front-loaded boot camp immersive experience and this lovely placement period where we're able to get ready for endpoint assessment maybe with a practice epa um, and real support for portfolio of meeting these occupational duties as well as continuing the things we always do that have resulted in really positive feedback from our hiring partners so it's a lot of information from me and we could dive into some other areas but it's at this time that we ask for some feedback from you as to what would be useful to hear about in the last part of my presentation. Alex, I'll hand back to you. Thanks, Diana. That was super comprehensive. Really, really exciting to hear about the changes that put the employer firmly in the driving seat. Um, of course, we're very, very curious to hear from you about what other digital apprenticeships you might be considering alongside software development. And I can see that a number of you have already uh, voted on the poll. If you look at the, the control panel at the bottom of your screen or perhaps it's at the top, um, there should be a button that says polling. If you haven't yet voted, I would encourage you to, to vote now just so we can inform the content of the rest of the session. I can see that a lot of you have voted already, so there's probably enough to go on there. Diana? <laughs> Fantastic, Alex. Would you mind sharing the results for us? Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> I will end the poll now. Okay, one second. Okay, you might you might be able to see them now. Yeah, fantastic. So overwhelmingly, um, just over half of us would like to hear about both. Um, so I'll dive straight in. We're really excited at, at Makers now that we've really consolidated our software development practice um, to extend into DevOps. It feels for us really the right time. It's important to note um, in this particular um, forum that um, this is not a new standard. So, so this is not one that has been part of the digital route review. This is an apprenticeship standard that is just new because it was written and published in April of this year. So it's a new standard, but not one that's come out of the digital review. 
Now, the reason why that's important is this new apprenticeship was the first sign of things to come that we've seen from this review. So this particular apprenticeship, you'll be assured to know, does not have a knowledge module, doesn't have a vendor qualification, and very much takes the structure of our new software development apprenticeship. So we're able to front load training and deliver um, a placement. The EPA has um, a different, um, if you like, content to the software developer, but there are similarities um, and they still come down to a professional discussion and a project. So as I said, it was published in April of this year, and we've only recently received um, an endpoint assessment organisation approval, which essentially means that BCS, who we currently work with, are approved to assess this now. So we're all ready to go with this apprenticeship standard now that we're able to assess. And at its simplest, the reason why Makers is involved in this is for us, DevOps is a philosophy and a way of working that brings together two historically disparate parts of an IT organization, namely those who develop the software and then those that are then required to support it in a live environment. And for us, this is a really exciting opportunity. The DevOps engineer encapsulates both disciplines for us, requiring individuals to understand um, and appreciate how their code functions when being used in the real world, and then troubleshoot any issues that may arise while taking a cloud um, infrastructure focused perspective. So using this blend, this hybrid of both skills, this provides a real opportunity for us um, at Makers. The convergence of these kind of two topics drives DevOps culture now um, and, and particularly has created the need for this new role um, in the sector for DevOps engineers. And it's for this reason that we've blended um, our original program with a um, master program at the end that involves an immersive delivery of DevOps. So in short, um, apprentices will join us and complete the 12 week software development course. And at the end of that course, they will graduate into a DevOps component of training. And this will be a six week program that follows um, an understanding of modern architecture. These are some of the knowledge breakdowns, but obviously as explained before, we have a very detailed occupational brief with the knowledge, skills and behaviour needed. And again, here at Makers, we're committed to not actually um, uh, providing one way of doing things, but very much being ag agnostic in, in the disciplines that DevOps um, needs and the techniques that are required. So for example, we'll be looking at many cloud providers to deploy um, and maintain cloud applications. Um, and there's just some of the ideas limited to this slide. Um, it's really exciting times for us at Makers um, and this DevOps it will be happening before January 21 um, as it was published in April this year. Um, but if we are interested at all on the call of going forward with this, our partnerships team at the end will be able to tell us how you get involved with this. So um, there was another request for us to talk about the software tester. Um, and again, um, this is one of the new apprenticeships that will be available from January 2021. Um, it's followed a very, very similar framework to the software development. So key points to note here, the knowledge module has been removed, the vendor qualification has been removed, um, the English and math content, the employer reference. So you'll recognize the same pattern that happened with software developer. Again, its endpoint assessment has changed. It has different components. Um, there's a practical test as well as a project for the software tester um, and the professional discussion. But again, lots of time on placement to get ready for this um, and um, as well as a larger window in order to pick the right time. So again, Maker's approach to this is very much to deliver our fundamental programme of software development. And again, similar to the DevOps, at the end of that 12-week training to commence a software testing module um, that delivers value from day one as a software tester once that course um, is completed. So again, lots of information on this slide um, and really important to note helpful links for those of you that have a specific interest perhaps in one field or you're interested in um, uh, many of them, um, in which case this presentation will be available um, after um, today and you'll be able to click on those links to learn more um, as well as go over the presentation. 
Um, thank you very much for um, listening um, and I'll hand over to Ed who will host um, the forum for discussion as well as coming back to answer any questions you may have. Thanks Diana. Thanks. Just before we hand over to Ed, I just got a very, very quick bit of housekeeping on uh, how to get involved in, in the discussion part. If you do want to ask a question or make a comment, uh, please use the raise hand feature in the participants section and unmute yourself when, when called and feel free to give a brief introduction, your name, your job title uh, before jumping in. And if, if you'd prefer not to, to speak, there's also the option to submit questions via the chat. I've seen we've got a couple coming through already. Um, yeah, over to you, Ed. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. And Diana, thank you um, uh, uh, again for, for, going, for going through all the, that information. It's, um, it, was very, it was very good to, to hear again from, from my perspective. Um, uh, uh, welcome, everyone, again. Uh, my name is Ed. Um, it's great to see everyone here. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe Diana, if you uh, stop sharing your screen, uh, we can just see everyone's faces. Maybe that'd be a nice thing to do. Um, um, yeah. Awesome, look at that, fantastic. Um, oh, I guess see everyone. Uh, hello again. Um, so um, what I'd like to do is uh, essentially uh, open up the, this conversation and, and figure out maybe with two questions that I want to sort of give everyone a, a, a prompt uh, to think about. Um, and, and the first one is, is, is more about what do you want to leave today knowing? And uh, now that you've heard a lot about uh, the, the sort of executive summary of the changes uh, for, that have come through the digital review and heard a little bit more about what we do, um, uh, 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 what do you want to leave today knowing? And, and I'd like to sort of invite you all to use uh, the chat function and just like submit your questions, submit your thoughts about what do you want to leave today knowing? And we've, we've got a bunch of time to hopefully make sure we get uh, through to this or at least direct you to the right people. Um, uh, so use the use the chat function and just uh, give your thought about what you want uh, to lead today knowing. Um, and, and then uh, once we've sort of like spent some time in that question, the second prompt I want I want us to all think about is um, is the section that like I like to call them. Um, Wouldn't it be great if makers did and then blank? Um, so thinking about what your what, what what are your pain points, what are your needs, or, or when you think about uh, why you're here for uh, the, thinking about apprenticeships, what what would, what would be great if you could come to makers and be like, hey makers, could you be able to uh, do this for us? Um, so those are those are the, those are the two uh, the two problems. Let's start with the first one. Um, I know we're getting a couple of questions at the moment, so feel free to use the chat function or just um, um, uh, unmute yourselves and go. But I'll, I'll be facilitate it just by um, asking the individuals a question to to maybe uh, unmute themselves and talk a little bit more about the question. Um, so let's. Um, Let's go another 30 seconds for people to write down their questions and then I'll, um, I'll just uh, uh, introduce the first question if, if that's all right. So let's just wait a couple more seconds. Some really great questions so far. Uh, I'm looking in the, in the Zoom chat. Cool. So, uh, Dan, I'm probably going to lean on your experience here with with uh, with, with the apprenticeships and um, and then anyone else who feels like they can uh, chip in here. Let's uh, let's 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 start with some of those questions and feel free to always keep asking questions and throwing them on the Zoom chat. Even if we don't get to it in this session today, uh, we should be able to come back to you with some with with more information. Um, um, okay, so uh, uh, this might be one for also the partnerships team. Let's go with uh, if someone has a level six degree in a non-tech discipline, uh, can they be a tech apprentice? So Patrick, um, would you mind, uh, um, uh, uh, Patrick Chan, if you just give a little bit more context to this question and then we can, we can start, start there. Yeah. Hey. All right, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Patrick Chan, uh, rather than uh, Patrick Linnett. <laughs> Hi, um, so like, you know, people changing career or they, you know, they did like um, a degree in art, for, in art, for example, and they want to like move into tech, it's quite hard to get into tech and an apprenticeship is maybe the way forward. Can they be, you know, join the apprenticeship? Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to take that question, Patrick. It's a great question. Um, and here at Makers, we're super proud um, of kind of the career change um, 
cohort that we have in many of our products and absolutely um, a degree in another discipline shouldn't stop anyone from applying to the tech apprenticeships. Um, so there is prior learning discounts um, for apprentices that perhaps have done an A-level or a prior IT training, um, but a degree in a non-tech background wouldn't be something that penalised you through um, an application process at all and in our experience we found it really enhances um, individuals in terms of the wider skills needed to be a software developer um, so we actively encourage the, um, that kind of background as well. Does that answer your question Patrick? Yes thank you. No worries. Awesome. And the discounts are like if you have the knowledge already um, in some IT areas you get a discount that's like a yeah, so um, how that might work is, um, for example, if um, an individual had been quite proactive um, and taken on some courses, perhaps in a particular programming language, um, the overall cost of the apprenticeship would be slightly discounted because obviously there would be some coding um, ability there and um, that would give us a head start in terms of the resource needed to train you. So yeah, that's how it works and, and that's a varying amount. So some people have nothing, which is absolutely fine, and some people have a little bit more, which doesn't penalise them from joining our programmes. Thank you. Awesome. Um, okay, so we have another question from Louise um, uh, saying, how do we recruit apprentices? Um, Diana, that might be one for you, or maybe Grant as well. Uh, let's, uh, let's start off with, 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 with Diana. How do, we, how do we recruit apprentices? Yeah, um, so we have an amazing partnerships team um, who probably at this point are the best uh, people to answer that question. So I'm going to hand over to Grant on our kind of recruitment and selection process. Thanks, Diana. Thanks, Ed, and uh, thanks for the question. I, so I suppose it's really important um, uh, this question has come up because uh, one of our existing hiring partners who couldn't make the call actually emailed me just now to say the same thing. Um, so, uh, so hopefully we can send the recording after. Um, so uh, we're really quite strict uh, uh, with our resourcing uh, procedures because uh, we really want to make sure that the time invested is invested in uh, the right people and that they will be successful in transferring forming their lives um, and we take uh, a three-step approach uh, when we're uh, looking at uh, bringing in anyone onto uh, the apprenticeship program. Uh, working in conjunction with uh, yourselves, the hiring partners, uh, we'll map out those three stages and they consist of first an initial screen, um, second uh, some challenges and a third uh, an exercise or uh, um, a uh, sometimes a pair programming uh, exercise. Now the reason I'm being quite vague on those three principles is because we, we tend to tailor dependent on the hiring partner and understanding their process um, so sometimes the uh, cultural and sort of screening element can be slightly different and tailored to meet uh, the hiring partner's needs but uh, typically we cover a three-step process and then we'll score across those three processes which includes the kind of interview screening element, uh, the challenges, uh, and then uh, the coding pair programming or, or, or other exercise. And, and, and as I say, um, we've adopted a lot of this from uh, our experience now trained, I believe, 1,800 developers uh, and brought them to uh, various programs and, and understood that those uh, three uh, components are really key for sort of uh, uh, identifying those who are going to succeed in a career in coding when in mo almost all cases, most have never coded before. Um, so, uh, and, uh, and, and hopefully that answers your question. Uh, was there any, any more detail you wanted on that? Thank you, Grant. Appreciate that. Um, is it that people uh, approach you as an apprentice to try and get onto your course? Is it that um, a third party we would try and um, give you a, a group of people that we would want to put through it? How does how do you actually get hold of the apprentice? Great, great question, it? Louise. So, yeah, so there's, there's, there's a number of talent acquisition methods that we follow. Um, because we're running a number of programs uh, all the time, so um, uh, uh, some of the recent programs that we've run talent acquisition for uh, is the Google Software Development Apprenticeship and the Government Software Development Apprenticeship. Now, um, as you can imagine, uh, when you say the word Google, it's a very popular uh, uh, software development apprenticeship. And we're fortunate to be able to have a wide ranging pool of candidates uh, that we are able to keep hold of through all of our talent acquisition, which means that we've always got a good pool of candidates who have applied to hiring partners and looked for apprenticeship programs that we can look into. 
The second one, as you mentioned, there is always internal applicants within businesses that may want to change career and transform into uh, software development, DevOps, or, or software tests. Um, and uh, the third is um, our, our, just our brand and our network. We're known for transforming lives, taking people from jobs that might be at risk of displacement, might have just not be enjoyable anymore, and they want to sort of seek out and change and, and go into an interesting digital career. And we, we attract a lot of people through that route. And also in that sort of third bucket is, is our partnerships. So we partner with a number of the not-for-profit organizations and a number of uh, different groups who uh, really support those who want to transition, especially in the underrepresented groups. So quite a wide range of, of people we can access. Excellent, that was really helpful, thank you. No worries. Um, uh, awesome. That's a, a really great question and a, and a really great answer. Um, uh, Suzanne, uh, you have a question, um, and your question is: um, How much uh, does it cost versus the non-apprentice makers graduates? This might be a question directly back to you, Grant. Thank you. Um, uh, so. Um, the cost depends on the program. So as I just explained to, to Louise just there, there's, there's a number of bespoke elements that we can do. Whilst the, the sort of overall program is structured in a very similar way, there's some nuances between hiring partners depending on the program. So um, I would be more than happy to explain that based on understanding uh, what your need was, uh, uh, Suzanne, so, um, uh, and, and give you a full detailed overview of what the costs look like if you reach out to myself or one of the partnerships team uh, my email is quite simple. It's just grant at makers.tech. Um, uh, so my first name at makers.tech. So, uh, and I'll, I'll be able to give you the full details of once I understand what the programs you want to compare. Thank you. It's cool. a great use of the emoji uh, as well, Suzanne. Uh, <laughs> nice thumbs up. Um, and uh, awesome. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, uh, Diana. I was just going to add to, to, to Grant's point about um, the difference really uh, with the apprenticeships for those of you that don't have the um, background is that there's an apprenticeship levy that companies pay into um, so the costing of the apprenticeship programs would come out of that levy as Grant um, described at different costs depending on, on the apprenticeship that was being pursued which is very different from our kind of non-levy route and of course the difference being that placement period after the immersive training at the beginning so slightly different costing um, models to that as well um, with additional kind of um, support provided by the training provider and I think that's another question that's somewhere um, in the chat. Cool. That's a nice clarification thanks thanks Diana. Um, uh, Patrick, we'll come back to your question in a little bit. I want to get to some other people's questions, so everyone has at least one question, uh, but we will come back to you. Um, uh, Emily Harris, uh, uh, your question is, uh, will the bootcamp be run remotely going forward? Um, uh, this is a, a really interesting question, and I'm, I, might, um, I might pass this to Diana first. Yeah, thanks, Ed. Um, and uh, we also have on the call with us today, Kay, um, who's head of training, who may go into um, some of the specifics of our remote delivery. Um, but we're, we're kind of um, heavily experienced at remote delivery, um, having done it for um, just over five years now. We've also delivered our apprenticeship programme remotely prior to the pandemic. So it's actually been a requirement and some tailoring that we've done for hiring partners. So we have a huge experience um, as well as success rate with remote delivery. And I think in this time, it's safe to say that um, it is our intention to deliver remotely um, until we've got better kind of guidance from the government. Um, but I can assure you in terms of the quality of education, it's something that's actually really supported um, um, our delivery model and we've been able to um, ensure the elements of how our curriculum is delivered, um, such as pair programming, the interaction with a human um, is still very much at the forefront of what we do when we deliver um, and, and we have great success at that. Um, I don't know, Kay, if I've missed anything you'd like to add. Thank you, Diana. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, the, the key thing to, to note about our, our remote offering is it's, um, it, our, our, you know, people who train with us will spend more time interacting with other people remotely than any one of us do probably in, in our working day. It's, it's a very um, uh, uh, 
socialist may be the wrong word, but it's it's an interactive learning experience with people. It's not logging on to you know Udemy courses or anything like that or anything you might have come across with uh, virtual learning. It's it's about working with other people, and so that's a, a a really key part of our remote offering. Another real you know advantage I think that we found across this period, which is I think encouraged more of our our, our partners to uh, try out remote, um, is so. There's always been this sort of bridge that has been difficult to sort of cross sometimes between the education environment and the work environment and bringing these together and being able to um, uh, uh, literally have people um, experience being you know, with their colleagues and being with us in the same day, in, in the same day with relatively little disruption um, has been a really, really interesting and, and I think integrative experience. Ultimately, an apprenticeship is a job with training and I think remote really brings that with together. There's no going over to the training center. There's none of that. It's all about integrating the education and employment, which is ultimately the core of what an apprenticeship is about. So I think there's, there's huge scope um, uh, and we've done a really good job, I think, of bringing this together over the past year. And, and, and even more so in the future. I think the, the potential is huge. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, was, was there anything else to follow up with that question, Emily? No, that was sure. great, thanks. Cool. Ed, I just thought uh, I'd just yeah, um, go ahead. Mm -hmm. ju jump in and Emily, and I think the other benefit with remote, which we're seeing, which we're getting a lot uh, of feedback from hiring partners is the ability to, if for those who have multiple offices, even other international offices, to be able to put people to train together in groups. And we've really seen a benefit of, of that uh, for, through the remote delivery, um, whereas before uh, you had to be sort of uh, paired in your sort of offices or your, your locations and uh, that sort of uh, cross-functional working across uh, geographical locations um, has been a real win in the remote world, uh, especially with uh, some of the hiring partners that we've worked with in the last six months. Cool, thank you. Nice answers, folks, and good questions. Uh, Louise, um, let's go on to uh, Robin first, cause just because uh, I want to do one question per person at the moment. Um, although, Robin, your, your question is rather not a question. It was my second prompt, wouldn't it be great if? So we'll come back to that actually later. So let's go back to Louise. Is there a set starting time for each cohort? Are there any set requirements for someone to become an apprentice? So this comes back a little bit back to the recruiting phase, and this may have already been answered. So let me just double check, Louise. Um, uh, 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 this question um, uh, what would you like to know about it uh, there's further? more the, the time that we're before so you talked about the software developer starting in January you know it, it, does everyone start on the same day in January was really my, my question about the start time and then um, do they should they have a certain amount of qualifications before they join I know you talked about them be, getting a reduction if they would got a degree but are they expected to have you know a certain number of GCSEs or a certain number of um, A levels or anything before you take them on or is it purely on on those three elements that you've done of this screening that you, you talked about Grant? So maybe Grant you want to handle the sort of the, that side of it first and then yes. maybe we can go to Diana for the other part. Yeah, so it's a great question. And actually, I, I, I do see the differences there. There is this kind of uh, the profile of the person and the kind of uh, uh, selection process that we follow to get them on. Yeah. Um, it's fair to say that we do look at that through those processes. So we are looking at people who have the aptitude and the desire uh, to really put themselves through that transformation. Um, so we are looking for uh, initially those people who are ready to go through that transformation because uh, whilst 12, 12 weeks, three months sounds to some a long time, uh, to completely change career and be able to code from day, like day one when you land in placement, um, it's quite a transformation journey. So, so we are assessing and we're looking for uh, sort of uh, uh, their profile, their aptitude, and their, they want to do this. Um, and, and the second thing uh, that we are looking for is we are looking that they've attempted to uh, look at coding or they understand and they know where to look. So um, what we don't do, uh, what we definitely don't do, is we don't look at academic uh, criteria. We don't select based on academic criteria. Um, a, a lot of uh, hiring partners historically have asked for uh, STEM degrees or other things like that. Um, and sometimes uh, 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 we uh, advise those customers that obviously if we're looking at uh, bringing in a really diverse pool, um, then it's really important um, given the stats that we know across different academic uh, uh, um, 
degrees or different uh, upper subjects um, that you can really kind of pigeon yourself, a uh, pigeonhole yourself into a small group of people from a certain background or profile. And what we want to do is uh, remove that. So we don't want to select based on academic at the start um, to, to, to reduce the pool. Um, so yeah, but we do look at those kind of uh, profile attributes. Excellent, that's good. I, I wouldn't want to uh, have get someone's hope up that in the company that wanted to go towards it and therefore and then suddenly curtail them because they hadn't got whatever qualifications. So that's really clear. Thank you. And then just the timing then, Ed, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, all our cohorts, uh, we try to start on, on the same day and we have a three month immersive experience. Um, so uh, we have like a, you know, an orientation period, a day one, uh, and then like a sort of day at the end of it uh, that we call the demo day. So everything is like a bookended period of time. Um, uh, so it's not like a rolling start date, it's a, uh, there's a, there's a start date and an, and an end date um, in, in general. Um, and um, in, it, it, was there a particular uh, apprenticeship that you were thinking about when you when you were thinking about January? I know you mentioned January as a the, the software month. developer one, yeah. So just understanding what timeline we'd have to to do to to get Absolutely. people ready in order to start that. Diana, what's a, what does it look like for our next apprenticeship cohort uh, for, for the software developer uh, standard? Yes, thanks, Ed. So really important to say that the um, original or legacy software development apprenticeship is still live. It hasn't been withdrawn and there will be an overlap period, obviously, because there will be apprentices still doing their qualification. Um, so you're able to join um, our next cohort. Uh, we've got one starting in September um, and our next one after that will be November um, in terms of the traditional delivery of software development. But in this quarter, we also have a start date for DevOps, um, for those of you that are interested, uh, with enough lead time for anybody that's interested on this call to, to get involved with that. Um, in terms of the new revised standards, they will become um, all things going well with ministerial sign off from January. Um, so again, um, as Ed explained, we'll have a cohort starting in January. Um, and then I would imagine at the end of the quarter, another cohort. Um, so lots of opportunities to kind of get involved. Um, if there is a specific need to fast track talent, um, as Grant explained at the beginning of the call, there are some options, some of which are apprenticeship options. So we have a rapid response apprenticeship, um, which has a lead time of two weeks. Um, and that gives access to a pool um, of candidates whereby we go through a selection process, as Grant explained, um, of the hiring partner choosing from the pool of candidates as we have um, and we're able to get started a lot quicker so it, it really depends on kind of your needs um, and us meeting those needs through um, whichever product serves you best um, I think that covers most most things um, yep. is that okay Louise yeah super helpful thank you Louise did you want an answer from the perspective of uh, an employer uh, I'm from Ford Mobility Europe and we have put people on uh, we're planning on putting people on a cohort in September and we have put people on previous cohorts. So did you want an answer from the employer perspective or not? Because I can help with that if you do. Yeah, it'd be great to hear your view as well, if you've got sure. some input. <laughs> Certainly, um, I can try and answer that then. Um, so we're, we're planning on uh, putting a number of people on starting um, on the 28th of September cohort for the software developer. We started um, towards the end of June um, because we had some positions that um, already had people in them that were interested in going and we created some new positions as well. So to allow people to apply for uh, moving to software um, engineer roles and to allow time for um, actually doing um, the kind of pre-assessments and interviews and all of that kind of stuff and to move jobs for those that need to move jobs um we we kind of started around um the end of june and that timing has worked really well and you know we've done previous cohorts where we've done everything last minute as well and makers were really accommodating and made it happen um but it's much nicer to kind of do it in a more planned and coordinated way and um we're already thinking now about you know what we can do to start working on um sending more people for the january cohort as well Brilliant, thank you. That really helps to, to set my mind of how much we need to prep beforehand. So thank you. Sure, no problem. Thanks, Gulam. And uh, I'm glad that didn't look prompted or that we paid you. So uh... <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank, thanks. Uh, thanks for the, the, the question, the reply, and, and everything. It was nice. Um,
Uh, okay, so if, if we if we have a look at, uh, I want to come back to uh, this question I missed a little bit earlier to uh, Danny's question. But before we get there, uh, we're from the theme of thinking about the experience, there is this front loaded training that we offer as part of the apprenticeships training. Um, uh, Kerry, you have a question about: Is the virtual experience the same? Um, are there um, uh, still lots of group sessions? Do you still include the meditation and mindful side? Um, I think we have uh, Kay as head of training. That might be the best person to talk about uh, that. Uh, yes, absolutely. It's um, it would be wrong to say that we're um, exactly trying to recreate the on-site course because it's it's a different environment. You have to be responsive to that. Um, but the needs of the students are, are, are the same, or, or in fact, you know, even even greater in this in this time. Um, and so particularly on the holistic side, on the emotional support side, all this stuff is, is still as key as, as it has been on site. And so it's a, a central part of what we do. Ultimately, it's um, like the rationale behind this is not, um, although it's, it's great to be great to people, I'm sure we, we, we all agree with that. Um, our course is an immersive, intensive experience. And so people need to be, you know, fit, mind, uh, mind, mind body and spirit um, to really to really you know take on this 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 challenge and so we're, we're we support them with that on, on on the holistic side as well okay great and so i think it's a great question and thanks for your uh, reply king um uh, uh, i think danny has already left the call but it might be a good segue let me just quickly read through the any other questions um so um Wait, uh, Patrick, get a couple of questions before we move on to the, the, the second prompt. And maybe we can all think about the second prompt, which is, again, uh, uh, what, wouldn't it be great if makers did and then space for you to like fill out? Um, um, uh, and so, uh, Robin, you've already, you've already had, a, had a good go at that question. So maybe I'll invite everyone else to think about that um, uh, but while we uh, have a look at Patrick's questions. So, Patrick, you said, um, uh, what, qu what qualifications will you receive? Um, um, and maybe wrapped up into uh, sort of apprentice salary examples. Um, let's go to Diana, maybe with the certifications and then salaries to grant. Yeah, thanks, Ed. Um, so in terms of the legacy um, apprenticeship that we're running from September um, until Christmas, um, you gain what is a, a level four, um, which is equivalent to a foundation degree, um, qualification. Um, within that also um, there's the ability to pass your functional English and maths if that's not something that the candidate has already um, and there's a vendor qualification in in a software um, piece that that you've chosen in line with your hiring partner needs in the context you're working on so for example um, some of us might get a qualification in Java um, some of us might get a qualification in SQL um, and they are kind of Microsoft um, accredited or Oracle accredited, depending on the one that you do. Um, and uh, for our um, apprentices that pass with a high mark, they get automatic um, um, entry into the Institute of Art, um, iTech, uh, which is the Institute for um, Technology. Um, and again, you become an accredited member as a result of passing the level four qualification. Um, and if you pass the qualification, you still have um, entry into um, the Institute. Um, but there's just a, a few more ring fences to jump through. So yeah, a, a double accreditation there. Um, and likewise with the revised standards, um, there is the equivalent still there, it's still accredited at level four. Um, some of the 12 standards there are at level three, which is A-level equivalent. So, but the ones that make us provide are level four equivalents um, currently, um, but they won't have the vendor qualification. Um, what we have been discussing um, with a number of our hiring partners is a need to still get accreditation um, in a number of um, kind of software programming languages and we're looking very much to respond to that and provide the opportunity on placement to get that if that's something that hiring partners want and need from their from their devs um, and that's particularly appealing I think in DevOps at the moment in terms of certification of um, certain services so um, yeah it, it, it's that's the basic accreditation and then there's some routes into getting further accreditation if that's useful does that answer the question hopefully is that um danny that had left ed 
Uh, that was, might have been Patrick, I think it was maybe Patrick's question. Uh, Patrick yeah, yeah, that's good, thank you very much. No worries, no worries, thanks Patrick. Um, um, and sorry, yeah. Sorry, yeah, so on the, on the question of salaries, so, yeah, so, on, on question of salaries, so uh, before I kind of give you the numbers, because of course they're easy, we see them, we, we know what they are, I just wanted to sort of give some context on this, and um, there's a lot of different approaches when you're thinking about salaries for apprenticeships, and what I would urge any hiring partner to do is not try and treat apprentices any differently to any other entry level uh, software developers. And sometimes when you're pricing salary uh, based on thinking about an apprenticeship program, uh, businesses then think about them as a separate grade or a separate tier. And one of the things and recommendations that we've been working with a number of hiring partners is that there are lots of different routes to bring software developers in the entry level. Um, and actually they're all software developers with a certain skill set, and they're all sort of within a pay band. Um, so um, if you already have early talent programs and you already have software developers, it's important to think about what band they're already in and, and try not to create disparity between the program and, and the developers. Um, because, uh, you know, the culture of engineering is a really important one to preserve and you don't want to create different uh, factions or, or divisions. Um, so that's one recommendation I just always uh, uh, sort of mention and chat to, to hiring partners about when we think about uh, salary examples. Um, but to actually answer the question and give you a direct answer on the salary examples. Um, so we, we see quite a wide range. Um, <clears throat> so the sort of junior end of developers uh, in the market dictates between 32 uh, and 40,000. And we have seen some juniors in certain sectors be offered 45,000 uh, straight away. Um, but um, uh, I would say that the apprenticeships uh, scheme, uh, there is a significant investment. We have seen that sometimes start at 27. So, uh, so we have seen some businesses who uh, maybe pay for additional learning, accreditations, uh, invest and start at 27 and go up towards that 30 and 32 over time. Um, so, so the bracket would be across to take into account all hiring partners, 27 uh, all the way up to 40,000. That's a uh, nice answer and a good question. Um, and Robin, thanks for your, for your comment. Um, uh, you give them the same as a grad because they end up in a similar place after you. So that's a, it's a nice um, reflection from your perspective. Um, cool. Okay. So uh, I think those are all the questions at the moment. Um, and these questions came from uh, the prompt. Uh, what would you like to leave this uh, the session knowing more about and uh, making sure that you know, uh, we're able to answer the question? So uh, uh, let's just double check that. If, is there anything else that you, you want to make sure you get out of the session um, uh, about the changes uh, 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 that are coming up to uh, the apprenticeship standards um, through the digital review? What would you like to know? And maybe also think about like uh, how would you and uh, maybe uh, carry it out, what, what help, what support could we provide um, uh, you uh, delivering effectively uh, uh, on your side, um, uh, whether it's the sort of portfolio experience that the students are going to be, uh, the apprenticeships are going to be uh, going through, whether it's the endpoint assessment, uh, what is it that, that we can help you uh, with? Um, I've got a um, really quick one, do you mind if I yeah, go ahead. I'm just writing it all out. Um, so one thing, I've picked this up with Vicky on your team, but we had a bit of a uh, struggle with the marking being very inconsistent between our two apprentices we had this year. So I think one of the things I'd call out is, you know, I think you guys are already doing as much as you can, but really keep hammering BCS for clarity around what they're going to base their marking on some way that we can make that. Cause from our point of view, we'll give the apprentices whatever opportunities they need, but it's just not, it's just not clear. Like, you know, is this okay? Is that okay? If they do all pairing, is that going to disadvantage them, et cetera. Um, so yeah, particularly if we've got new standards, anything we can do to really nail down like what they're going to take into account when they mark them would be really good. Is there anything that we can talk about now on this, Diana? Yeah, um, um, Robin, just um, thanks in advance for your input because it's been really kind of so valuable with sort of campaigning to BCS and getting that point across from the hiring partner. And I think that's really been recognised in the revised standard um, because the assessment of the portfolio is by the training provider, not by the EPAO now. Um, and I think that recognises the challenges they've had to get consistency across their team. Um, so I think they've responded. But um, there's no. Sorry, could you clarify that slightly? What was the EPA 
I didn't, un I didn't know, I don't know what that acronym that's is. The, that's BCS essentially. So the EPAOs are the exam boards like City and Guilds, like BCS, um, that are accredited to assess the apprenticeship standard. Um, so in this revised um, uh, apprenticeship standard for software development, the onus to kind of review the portfolio will be on the training provider. Oh, that's great news okay cool really, yeah. really good news and um, <laughs> part of kind of our positive news and it becomes a much more um useful leverage because it's the basis for the professional discussion rather than a marked assessed piece of work without them knowing the context um so in that professional discussion they'll be able to anna like verbally annotate why they feel that you know that piece of evidence has has met the occupational brief which is um taken quite a lot of my time campaigning for that and so it's really nice that that's recognized in the review um and, and equally um the epa is very exciting which maybe not on this call but further on be really happy to share that with our hiring partners because there's some lovely opportunities now to do something that's a lot more useful and impactful uh, with the real world work projects but yeah point noted and there still is this time where we have to get our legacy um, apprentices through and we will continue to be very demanding of BCS to get it right as you know Robin. <laughs> yeah yeah nice one thank you. Um, yeah, th thanks for the question and the answer that was a, that was a, a nice a clarification. Um, just reading through the questions, um, I want to come back to a question that uh, the person who asked is not, not here anymore. Um, uh, but they uh, asked, like, what uh, are, we, are we thinking of offering a, an apprenticeship for uh, the, uh, the sort of analyst uh, apprenticeships, product and business? Um, and uh, uh, so the answer to this is really we're trying to figure out uh, across the board what's your, what are your needs. Um, um, and uh, one way that we're doing this is, is trying to uh, talk to a lot of people um, and, and, and understand this and figuring out uh, what makes sense for us. Um, so if you do have a hiring need, I definitely invite you to get in contact with, 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 with Grant, the partnerships team, or, or anyone here at Makers, and we'll be able to sort of, uh, uh, talk about it. Um, our mission is to uh, you know, uh, tr transform people's lives by integrating education and tech. So um, uh, definitely sort of get, reach out to us and, and, and have a look uh, what we can what we can do. Um, so uh, that goes that goes for everyone um, uh, so it's going to be more driven by by you and by what our research tells us rather than sort of making a jump and saying like these specific ones um, but 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 let us know and and, and robin uh, to come back to you you said wouldn't it be great if um a makers uh, offered uh, the option uh, for us to send junior devs uh, perhaps for, uh, former apprentices or graduated apprentices uh, to do the devops module to top them up on those skills and so that sounds like a uh, like a, an interesting need and and um, maybe could you spend two minutes like talking about uh, uh, that what, what's the what's the problem that you face and what um uh, how can we help solve that yeah totally um so from my point of view devops the trend in devops is towards it not being a role it's a it's a part of your t-shaped developer right mm -hmm. uh particularly as we move like we've just com just about completed a massive cloud migration so all our stuff is now sitting in the cloud lots of it's moving serverless all that kind of stuff so we need all of our devs mm -hmm. to to understand this fundamentally mm -hmm. um so i'm looking at you know microsoft accreditation etc to try and get but for a very junior dev a lot of those aren't appropriate so actually yeah. i'd much prefer to send them through makers if we can get a similar um it might be good though to be able to trend it to particular crowd cloud providers just mm -hmm. based on who we're currently using but yeah um but yeah that would be a i don't know if they'd prefer it right rather than going off to microsoft and trying to do something there so that sounds really. That sounds really interesting. Um, and the way that we're trying to think about the the course here, uh, or the, the the educational experience, is that we, we we might be able to structure things that, that the DevOps uh, section or the DevOps training is like an add-on module. You can start uh, rather than go through the whole uh, immersive experience. Um, so it's definitely something to think about. And so uh, and maybe if you haven't yet, just uh, have a chat with Grant about what we can do, or have a chat with Diana about how we can, how we can do this. Um, and from my side, I'll be uh, helping um, uh, sort of f form it and, and design it. Um, so I'll, I might be involved at some point, um, but go through, go through Grant and Diana uh, to begin with. Uh, is there any, any, any other thoughts or questions that people have about uh, when they think about, wouldn't it be great if makers did this for, for, uh, for us uh, about your hiring needs? Like what would some of those things be? Feel free to just like dive in and, and, and jump in with any kinds of apprenticeships or any kind of support training. Uh, 
I, I, Grant, I'm, sorry, I'm conscious of seeing Louise your question around the, cha the biggest change for companies in the new program in Jan and I suppose what could we do we could give you some advice on 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 that <laughs> and preventing the problem uh, that so that it doesn't come up um, uh, so um, and, and, I, and I think uh, I, I'll lean to Diana as well on this one but um, I think what's really important um, is uh, you know the 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 on the job experience and the placement and the being able to do work from day one um and so with the removal of some milestones the structure should only focus mostly on you know employer led and doing uh, doing uh, the day job to learn uh, and practice uh, what they're going to need to evidence and the biggest error uh, i think is the mindset from uh, hiring partners that um you know you separate out that journey so it's like this is when they learn and this is when they do whereas actually it's it's cohesive and um with the removal of some of those milestones and gates people could assume that you need to sort of find stuff for them to go off and do learning or find make sure they're away from the job and i think there's a there's a, there's a natural blend um of doing and and evidence in and being able to show the standard um, and so the biggest problem i think is that people try and fill the gap or fill the void uh, with sort of structured learning programs or time that might not be needed of course there will be an element needed which diana will talk about but but the um, uh, biggest challenge will be uh, making sure that you're continually treating them as a, as a as a software developer day in day out and making sure that they feel part of that team uh, uh, doing the job uh, diana is that a fair answer would you would you uh, intervene on any of that yeah absolutely and i and i think when the changes were first kind of published that was the immediate response by employers because it looks like a lot's been removed and so there looks like there's more flexibility but i think what i would stress is that um the standards were quite vague for anyone that's kind of been working on it post um the revision and they stepped into a domain now where they're really quite prescriptive and structured on the occupational brief um, and they've detailed very clearly what the knowledge and skills and behaviors must be in meeting those um, and so in doing that the compromise was then give us the capacity in placement to be able to do this without having to jump through hoops which aren't necessarily as robin shared on the chat really valuable in the work context um, um and more kind of other strings to the bow but perhaps not the most relevant in that context sometimes um so we've worked really hard as a training provider to make it useful by picking the right vq um, and to get the knowledge module done right at the start um, but these revisions enable us to be really like bespoke about the way we go about um facilitating working towards that occupational brief on placement um, so actually, I, I, I don't view it necessarily as um, uh, less structured. I actually think it's more achievable now without some of the kind of nuances as Robin referred to. And you're actually really free, as Grant said, to people develop that software dev. And don't forget as well, there's, there's some structure that will come from us as a training provider in terms of practice EPA activity, which again, doesn't have to be fitted around a million things. It's just one thing that we're all working towards um, um, doing so that the, the placement period is a kind of maturity um, so that they get to this point where actually the EPA is a graduation and a demo of how brilliant they actually are. Um, so I see it, that's why for me it's really positive obviously and I've come across as it's very welcomed uh, because sometimes there is quite a job to do in terms of education on, on, on getting hiring partners on board with some of the other elements I think is a fair um, response. Um, does that answer your question, Louise? Yes, it does. I mean, it's just I could see before all the different lines on the first um, chart that you showed and then it's like, whoa, they're all gone. So just making sure that, you know, I think I think it did say that there was a monthly check in. What I wouldn't want to do was to get to, say, month four of the training and then think that, you know, we were completely missing the point and the person just wasn't understanding it. But I think your your point about it being continual and they'd just be like a normal engineer within and part of one to ones and everything like that, we would hopefully pick it up soon enough. And like I say, you're all obviously selling it as a the change is positive because you've worked hard to get it. So I, I guess, you know, I stay with you on that journey that it, it will be a good thing. 
Yeah, Louise, and I think as well, it complements our kind of the progress to date we've made. So we've built an in-house tracking and monitoring system, um, like you said, with the monthly self-assessments and how they're meeting the occupational briefs. So we'll still be able to be as, as proactive and as supportive as we've been with delivering the legacy. Um, and there's a slight element to your initial um, question in this lead up to it. We're going to be doing so much work to support you as hiring partners to be ready, um, as well as um, revise fully our curriculum um, and make sure that the maker's values and our way of delivery is innate in that new standard um, and, and making sure all the things you love about what we do are there in the new um, revised standard. Yeah, it's just the fear, isn't it, slightly with it being more remote, it's, you know, just making sure that they're getting still, I would call giving them the love to make sure they were on that journey fully. Yeah, and I think what is, is, is really good about and the way that we operate is we have our own in-house support and monitoring processes. Um, and uh, what I can assure you on is that um, there hasn't been any more, any less kind of intervention that we've had to do. Our systems for tracking have picked up where there's need and we've been timely with our interventions. Um, we're still continuing to do things um, in a humane way in terms of like physical meetings, even if it is done <laughs> over Zoom. And so when people don't don't join those meetings we follow it up like we would do it um, physically um, and just making sure that we do pair programming online making sure we have that presence in their experience and, and that's super important now and it will be super important with these revised standards so um, again as I said today is the start of the first comms we're going to spend the rest of the quarter sharing why we're so kind of positive about this with you so yeah definitely more to come Thanks. Thanks, Diana. And, uh, and you always answer all the questions like really great. So uh, um, maybe I can just always ask uh, point of questions to you, Diana. Um, uh, Louis, just just double checking. Uh, it was was that uh, was that enough? Is that what you're looking for for uh, from your yeah, question? Yeah, exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. Um, um, we're coming up to the end of our end of our, end of our uh, time together, folks. And um, so uh, just another, another another call for it. any any last questions or thoughts or, 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 or reflections about what you wanted to get out of today, um, um, and how we can help support your needs. Ed, I think there was some in the call that may have left, but just for the sake of the recording, that um, his questions noted and answered. Um, mm -hmm. So, as I said, we have a wide audience, some of us that are very experienced in apprenticeships and others not, not, not so much and dipping our toes in. Um, so there was a question on what is Gateway? Um, so Gateway is the period of time that the apprentice is assessed by um, the exam board. So it's the end point assessment and that period where they're trying to meet the end point assessment is called Gateway. So it, 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 it's something that is in our current um, vocabulary for the apprenticeship we're running and it will remain. So gateway is that period of time when you're coming on to the final chapter, the final assessment time. So I hope that answers that question. Thanks, Diana. No worries. Thank you for, pick, for, for picking that up. I think it was actually your answer right at the very beginning. So <laughs> <laughs> Uh, to scroll all the way back up to find that question. Um, uh, uh, all right, folks, any, any other thoughts or questions? Um, uh, that, that we can help with. Uh, cool, so it shakes up her head, which, which sounds great. So we might be able to wrap it up. I might, I might pass it back to Alex then um, uh, uh, to, to wrap up. Um, uh, so over to you. Thanks, Ed. That, that was a fantastic discussion and very well chaired. So thank you for facilitating. Um, yeah, there's, there's nothing left for me to say than thanks everybody for joining and we'll be sharing the recording and Diana's slides uh, after the event via email. And if you have any other unanswered questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to your contact at Makers or via our website, um, and we'll make sure we get those answered for you. Thanks, everybody. Have a lovely day. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks me, and have a lovely day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.